Hello everyone, my name is Orly ben Light. I am an entrepreneur, women's achievement and empowerment activist, human rights defender, speaker, and mom. I am on the leadership team for the Middle East Committee for Women International League of Peace and Freedom, the oldest peace organization in the US. With me today is Avi Melamed, uh, a former Israeli intelligence official and senior official on Arab affairs. He served as the Salisbury Fellow of Intelligence and Middle East Affairs at the Eisenhower Institute in Washington, DC. Avi is the founder of Inside the Middle East Intelligence Perspectives, a distinct empowering educational program that provides an apolitical, nonpartisan education about the contemporary Middle East. Avi is also an author, and his new book is called Inside the Middle East, Entering, Entering a New Era, which will be available February 8th on Amazon. You can pre-order it now if you wish. Hello, Avi. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Hello, Oli. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Ta-da, ta-da. Avi, today we have uh, some organizations and even governments flooding the online space with fake news and propaganda. In order to develop critical thinking that allows us to distinguish between truth and lies, between facts and opinions, we need the widespread introduction of education. As an acclaimed Middle East expert, you are here to help us understand better the multidimensional perspectives on the Middle East through accurate, well-supported information. Avi, you say, to really understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we need to understand the Middle East and how some key players and their distinct strategic objectives are affecting the conflict. Can you please tell us who are the key players and how are they affecting the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Excellent question, Oli. Uh, indeed, as I'm always saying, the Middle East shapes the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And right now, there are a couple of major factors that are taking a uh, very substantial part in that. One of them is the Iranian hegemonic vision. The Iranian regime, the Mullah regime, is engaged in a very aggressive regional policy, trying to position itself as a superpower in the region. And to that end, the Iranian regime is playing the card of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Iranian regime supports massively Palestinian Islamist organizations like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and therefore perpetuates the continuation of the armed conflict. The second player, also a regional power, this is Turkey, that for its own reasons also wants to position itself as a superpower. And also Turkey plays the Israeli-Palestinian card. Again, Turkey supports Hamas, though not necessarily in the same scale and features that the Iranians are doing. But just the same, the involvement of Turkey in supporting or talking to all elements of the Palestinians basically is also adding to uh, the trajectory or impacting the trajectory of the conflict and not in a positive uh, direction. Another factor that plays very significant role in the shaping of the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the struggle that takes place today in the Arab world regarding the questions, where are we heading as societies? What is the shape and features of the modern statehood in the Arab world? This is not a new power struggle. This is a an old power struggle. It has been there since day one where Arab world was introduced to the concept of a modern statehood. Uh, this is an evolving power struggle, an enormously significant one, because it impacts enormously also, among many other things, the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As part of that enormously significant process, there is another factor that also plays a very significant role in the shaping and impacting the trajectory of the conflict. And that is what I called political Islam. I'm referring roughly speaking to a variety of political parties in the Muslim and the Arab world whose their agenda at core is an Islamic agenda. The well known one is the Muslim Brotherhood, for example. 
the Muslim Brotherhood, as well as other political Islam groups in the Muslim and the Arab world, are also experiencing a deep crisis as an outcome of the power struggle regarding the question, what should be the, the, the faith, the path, the direction of Arab and Muslim societies? That inner struggle, that inner friction within the Muslim Brotherhood also impacts the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Like, for example, Hamas, the Islamic Palestinian group that controls and governs Gaza Strip since 2007, Hamas is offspring of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the friction within the Muslim Brotherhood also is reflected within the ranks of Hamas. Another major player that significantly impact the trajectory of the conflict is the environmental, economic, social, and political challenges that the Arab world is facing in many ways. I'll give you just an example. The need in the Arab world to diversify the income revenues, for example, is something which is very significant in the uh, political and economic agenda of the Arab world. All the Arab world is engaged with that, including, by the way, the very wealthy Gulf monarchies. Uh, so that could explain, for example, this is one of the reasons that could explain, for example, the fact that today Israel is having, in addition to the peace agreement with Egypt and Jordan, Israel is having um, a peace agreement with uh, United Arab Emirates, um, a normalization agreement with Bahrain, and also normalization agreement with other Arab states like Sudan and Morocco. All in all, all those factors that I mentioned and other are basically playing very significant role in the shaping of the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that emphasizes what I have been saying for many years and long time, that this is an example of what I'm saying. In order to understand Israel, you have to understand the Middle East. The Middle East shapes the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you. It is commonplace amongst historians that mainstream Israelis and Palestinians write different histories. And it is common by the rest of the population that the other side has a self-serving story that is invented for propaganda purposes. In an article published in the Israel Studies Review, Paul Sham, a research associate professor of Israel Studies at the University of Maryland says, that historical narratives are of particular importance in the peacemaking process. For a conflict involving the passions of two societies, for generations to be settled, both sides must conclude that there has been some closure to the issues that gave rise to it. As a professional with a rare insider's view, you say that we will get nowhere using historical narratives, that it's important for us to understand and look at the realities of the Middle East today. Please explain that. Yes, Oli, this is a very significant point. Let me start by saying something very simple. I valid and respect almost, almost every narrative that I can think of, including narratives of the Palestinians, the Israelis, and others. Um, and with all the respect to narratives, in the end of the day, what I'm saying is very simple. If you want to impact reality, you must also dialogue with the reality. And narratives are not necessarily dialoguing with reality. They may partially dialogue with reality. They may totally not dialogue with reality, but they never ever totally dialogue with the reality. And in order to make an impact, you have to be prepared and willing to first understand the reality and more important, I would say, even to be prepared for the possibility that following the understanding of the reality, you may need to compromise some of your core narratives. This is very painful. This is very frightening. That's the reason why people are sticking to their narratives. This is why conflict sides are sticking to the narratives. This is why nations are sticking to the narratives but there is no other way. So roughly speaking, there are two options. You could either stay with your narrative and that's fine, that's legitimate. The meaning of that is that you probably will have a very small, if at all, understanding of the reality and as an outcome of that, you will not have a real capability or possibility 
to impact positively reality as you wish. The other option is, as I said, to be willing to understand reality, to learn and understand the reality, and understand that it may evolve um, a compromising of some of your core narratives. These are the two options. And I want to give you an example in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There is a very common narrative <clears throat> in the West that talks about Gaza Strip in the context of being occupied. But when you look at reality, and I emphasize that, I'm looking at reality. I'm not, I'm not an Israeli spokesperson. I'm not a Palestinian spokesperson. When you look at the reality, the reality is as follows. Gaza Strip is ruled since 2007 by a Palestinian Islamic movement that is called Hamas. Hamas has government in Gaza Strip. It employs 50,000 officials. It has 30,000 personnel. It has um, diplomatic representation in the globe. It um, uh, legislates laws. It is uh, uh, charging and, and, and collecting taxes from the population and so on and so on. In other words, Hamas governs the Gaza Strip. This is a government. Now, many people with good intention that really wants to help the people of Gaza are basically sticking to the narrative of Gaza is under Israeli occupation. But when you look at the reality, you understand that Gaza is ruled by a Palestinian factor, a government. Now, there are two options. One option is that the people who stick to the narrative that Gaza is occupied will stick to that narrative for whatever the reason is, and that's fine, that's legitimate. But then their ability to really understand the reality of Gaza and to make an impact in the context of the Palestinians in Gaza, that ability is very much slim. It's very little. The other option is that these people will say, oh, we have the narrative, but we understand the reality is different. There is a government in Gaza. It's called Hamas government. And we should hold Hamas as a government like any other government accountable for the situation in Gaza Strip. Why should they do that? For two reasons. One reason is that the Arab world and the Palestinians themselves are holding Hamas accountable as a government. And the other reason is that by holding Hamas accountable as a government for the well-being of the people of Gaza, what you achieve by that is that you are empowering the voice of people, Palestinians, who are claiming Hamas responsibility, who are demanding Hamas accountability. In other words, if you depart such a narrative, you could potentially, if you recognize the reality, you could potentially have a better chance, a better ability to shape positively the trajectory of the events. But isn't it true that the United States, United Nations, EU, and Russia asserts that any Palestinian government involving Hamas can only receive international rec recognition and aid if the group recognizes Israel, renounces violence, and accepts the PLO signed agreement with Israel? That is correct. Let's go now to Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah is, uh, has a historical significance with respect to the national and religious identity of both Palestinians and Jews. And this significance was invoked in the recent conflict between the two sides. Now, depending on the headlines we are reading on Sheikh Jarrah land dispute, we either are hearing that it's an illegal land grab by Jewish settlers an ethnic cleansing of Palestinians by Israel or the eviction of illegal squatters by Israel. Jews reclaim their neighborhood, which has always been rightfully theirs. Avi, what's the true story behind the stories about Sheikh Jarrah? Sheikh Jarrah in essence is a legal issue. It's a dispute over ownership and it's being discussed in courts. But like uh, many times when it happens in conflicts, in all conflicts, by the way, not only the Israeli-Palestinian one, uh, civilian issues, issues that in their core has nothing to do with the conflict are being channeled or uh, recruited to the conflict. 
There is a legal issue regarding ownership in the issue that is called Sheikh Jarrah, and it's being discussed in the Israeli court, including the Supreme Court. Now, associating the story of Sheikh Jarrah, which is a story of dispute regarding legal ownership, associating that with issue like uh, ethnical cleansing or brutalized oppression and other things, is a mistake. It's a mistake because in the end of the day, it's kind of like divert the understanding of the real story and it therefore compromises the ability of people with goodwill to really help both, both Israelis and Palestinians. And I'll give you an example. People in the world associates the story of the Sheikh Jarrah with the war between Israel and Hamas in May 2021. Unfortunately, people in the world fails to understand that the story of Sheikh Jarrah was nothing more than a trigger. It was a, a, a cause. The real story around the war in 2021 was the inner power struggle within the Palestinian. A couple of days before that people do not know or maybe forgot, the Palestinian Authority and its major power center, Fatah, uh, canceled elections that were supposed to held in the Palestinian Authority. That was an, a case that was playing to the hands of, Fat of Hamas, the major rivalry of the Palestinian Authority, who wanted to seize the opportunity and to position itself as the main speaker for the Palestinians to harvest political credibility and Hamas decided that this is a great conjunction, meaning the story of Sheikh Jarrah, the international attention, the fact that the story of Sheikh Jarrah was totally taken out of a context and was totally recruited to the story of the conflict, and the fact that the elections were canceled by the rivalry of Hamas, Fatah. Hamas decided it's a great opportunity, as far as he's concerned, to monetize these specific circumstances in order to do a move that will play decisively to the hands of Hamas and will once and for all position Hamas as the main Palestinian leader and therefore will mark the triumph of Hamas over its rivalry, the Fatah Palestinian organization. That is the wide context of the story of Sheikh Jarrah and the war in 2021. Um, I believe to the best of my understanding is that many, most, I would say, I would say even overwhelmingly, I would say media and educational circles in the West fail to reflect that picture that I'm sharing with you now. Most Israelis and Palestinians are fed up living from crisis to crisis. Most want what we all want to live in peace mutual respect and equal opportunities. Avi, is the Abraham Accord another door to peace, not necessarily through the Palestinian Authority? Definitely, the Abraham Accord is a very significant milestone uh, for a couple of reasons. First, the Abraham Accord joins already to an ongoing process where basically, roughly speaking, I would say the process of Israel being accepted in the region by the major Arab players. Reminding you, in 1979, Israel signed a peace agreement with Egypt. In 1994, Israel signed a peace agreement with Jordan. Uh, signing the peace agreement with United Arab Emirates, a major Arab leader, very significant player. Signing normalization agreement between Israel and Bahrain, um, signing normalization agreement between Israel and Sudan, signing a normalization agreement between Israel and Morocco. These are all very significant developments. They didn't happen out of the blue. They basically reflect an ongoing evolving process. That process has to do with a couple of things. I've mentioned some of them before, the story of the Iranian threat and um, challenge that Iran presents to the region the needs of countries in the region to deal with their own environmental, economic, social challenges, the power struggle within the Arab world regarding the issue of new statehood, model of statehood. These are all things that basically have nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The importance of that is because of all these factors, 
they have dictated, shaped a new geostrategic political agenda and priorities in the Arab world. And one of the manifestation of that change is that though on a emotional, symbolic, diplomatic, um, cultural level, the issue of Palestine is very close to the hearts of the Arab world, to the people in the Arab world, it is now being downgraded. It's now being um, um, not in the same priority as it used to be in the past because the geostrategic priorities of the Arab world has been dramatically changed. This is one thing. Uh, one interesting example in that context is that not so long ago, Arab rulers and governments could play very effectively the symbol of let us all go and free Palestine. Saddam Hussein was doing that. Muammar Gaddafi was doing that. Zain bin Abadin was doing that. And many other governments and rulers in the Arab world. The Arab world today doesn't buy that anymore. Um, and this is one of the interesting outcome of the fact that the Palestinian cause, though, as I said, very dear to the heart of people in the Arab world, has plummeted in the political agenda and priorities of the Arab world. And we have different examples of that. For example, the signing of the peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, the moving of the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, the, the recognition of Trump administration and the Israeli uh, rule in the Golan Heights and many other examples. Um, so, this is a great example that actually shows us how things are so dynamically changing in the region and how significant it is to understand, particularly for Western audience, and particularly for Western audience who is involved in the story of the Israeli and Palestinians, Western audience that wants to make an impact, a positive impact for both Israelis and Palestinians, how significant it is to understand this dynamic, dramatically changing reality. And what we are talking right now is just scrapping the surface. Because, you know, when you read my new book, which is titled Inside the Middle East, Entering a New Era, you can find many layers of understanding why do I make this dramatic statement. After decades of entrenched conflict, failed rounds of diplomacy, and continuous flare-ups of violence such as last May, Israelis and Palestinians mirror each other in their lack of faith and seeing each other as a good faith partner for peace. You said thinking out of the box is the only realistic approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Can you please tell us more about your thinking out of the box and explain that? Sure, definitely. I'll start with a simple um, uh, statement, but I will explain it. Peace between Israel and Palestinian today is not a real option. I'm not saying that because I don't want peace. I really want peace for Israelis and for Palestinians, for my daughter and my son and for the kids of the Palestinians. I'm saying that because Two things. One, when I'm looking at the reality, which is what I'm doing, when I'm looking at the many components of the reality, when I'm looking at the uh, powers involved, we just talked shortly about some of those powers. When I'm looking at the components and the circumstances, I come to the simple conclusion that it's impossible today to have a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine. Fine. Now that I basically made this observation, which by the way, it's an observation that I made five, 10, 15, 20, and 25 years ago in my positions and they are still valid. Now let's put it aside and ask ourselves, okay, what can be achieved? And the answer is arrangement. One of the interesting thing about that, uh, 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 that um, aspect is that it's interesting to, to notice or important to notice that uh, the people of the Middle East doesn't necessarily think in English. And the concept of peace, which is uh, coming from the mindset of Western uh, you know, uh, uh, orientation, 
is not necessarily overlapping the concept of the people in the Middle East. In the Middle East, um, disputes and conflicts are inevitable. They are not if, they are just only a question of when and why. And therefore, what you need to do is to create a set of mechanisms and arrangements that will, uh, as much as possible, perpetuate a situation of stability. And those arrangements from time to time need to be uh, maintained one way or another. If, if we depart from the concept of peace and now we are entering to the world of engagement Middle East style, this is a different, this is a different story. Now we are on a ground that we can do something, we could move, we have some maneuvering, maneuvering um, space. And then there is another thing, and that is the, um, when you, as I'm doing, when I am looking every day, day in, day out, this is what I'm doing. I'm spending 24 seven trying to collect information and understand what is going on in the region for many, many sources and trying to build the cohesive picture. I am, um, I'm, the more I know about the players involved, their interests, the specific time they are right now, because it changes, the more I can say decisively, okay, I think that we can uh, identify that direction as a potential one, or I think that we can identify that direction, or we shouldn't take that path because it's probably going to be leading to a, to a dead end. So in the context of arrangement of Israeli Palestinian between Israel and Palestinians, what I'm saying is very simply, very simple. The only way to achieve such arrangement must be done in a context of a regional environment, regional envelope. That includes the major Arab players. We're talking about Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we are talking about significant players like Jordan, Morocco, Sudan. Um, and when I'm looking at the picture today, I'm saying those players are clearly have interest in creating or ensuring circumstances or uh, conditions for such an arrangement. And they also have the power to make sure that such an arrangement will sustain, will continue. Um, so this is one thing. So when I'm talking about thinking out of the box, the elements of thinking out of the box are depart the Western mindset, endorse the Middle Eastern mindset of engagement, identify the factors that can and should play role in creating this environmental uh, or envelope, uh, I would say, um, structure, uh, scaffolders that could support an arrangement, and then bring in, in addition, global players that could provide an additional scaffolders to hold this structure. It can be done. Um, much more complex conflicts in the world than the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts were solved. Um, it can be done. It just calls upon for putting aside for a moment our narratives, Israeli narratives, Palestinian narratives, Western narratives, looking at the reality, understanding the reality, learning about the reality, that provides us a better chance to, to come up with a out of the box thinking and therefore maybe to move to the next phase, which to be implement out of the box thinking. Studies on effectiveness of peacekeeping operations show that people-to-people -people activities are affecting practical changes to improve the quality of life and engagement within and between target communities. The United, the United States is uh, funding the Alliance for Middle East Peace, A-L-L-N-E-P, $250 million over the next five years to expand peace and reconciliation programs in the region. Avi, can you suggest some other good peace building tools organizations can use to bring about meaningful impact on some of the most central issues in the Middle East that would help the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? 
Well, Orly, um, as I said before, look, the, I think that the major valuable thing that I can bring to the table is very simple, but it's crucial. Because without that component that I'm going to say in a few seconds, nothing will take off the ground. And the component I'm bringing to the picture is very simple and it's very crucial and it's called education, meaning in the sense of like educating anyone, NGO, governmental agencies, policy making, media people, academia, and on and on, to inform them as much as possible with the cohesive picture of the reality of the Middle East. If for example, a wonderful organization called X that is engaging people to people and he's doing a great effort and wonderful people that are really trying to make change, to, to promote peace, to help peace, all of these wonderful things. If they are operating in, a, in an, an environment that they don't understand, and in an environment that they don't understand who the real players impacting that environment, they, in the end of the day, as it happened so far, find that their efforts, energy, funds, good intention uh, has been um, reaching a dead end, if not worse than that. Hmm? Now, I don't have a magic wand, but I do have a method. We do have an approach, an educational approach. Uh, you know, the, the NGO that I founded in the States inside the Middle East Intelligence Perspective, ITME, is doing exactly that. We are not advocating anything. We are not representing any narrative. We are just educating about understanding the complex reality of the Middle East because without that, you cannot have a breakthrough. You, you can't really, if you're working so hard to help the people of Gaza and to help their neighbors, the people of Israel in the, in the communities next to Gaza, in Sderot and other places, but you fail to understand the involvement of Iran in the story of Gaza, you will not be able to make a change. You will not be able to really help the people that you really genuinely want to help. With despite and, and with all the respect to whosoever NGO agency goodwill is. I agree. I agree. So education, education, education. That's what we education, need. Education, 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 um, thorough education, questioning education, empowering critical thinking. All those things, uh, you know, Oli, you started our discussion and you mentioned terms that became unfortunately quite of our everyday life. You talked about fake news, you know, and how can we navigate our way in such a world which is overwhelmed by floods of information and particularly disinformation. social. Disinformation continuously. Yes, absolutely. So, so, you know, and we are overwhelmed by social media and by every milliseconds we got information, quantities of information that we are flooded with every second, every millisecond is equal to the whole information in the history of mankind. Exactly. Um, and this is of course, it's, it's a major challenge. It's a major challenge. It can be addressed. It can be addressed. We, at least in what we are doing in Inside the Middle East Intelligence Perspective, our NGO, we are actually teaching people practical basic tools, user-friendly tools that are taken from the world of intelligence, how to navigate the world the, the way in a such challenging environment which is over flooded with information, how to evaluate reliability of information. You may say that we are providing what I call the critical thinking instinct to people without even going into depth, deep research and studies, just sort of an instinct when they look and when they come across information in Twitter, in Facebook, in Instagram, in TikTok, just in a, in a matter of seconds or minutes, people can look at this information and say, oh, I evaluate the reliability of information as 
quite reliable or I have doubts, I have questions. And this is something that has to be inserted. Uh, it has to be thought. And, and, and this is our educational task. And we know based upon working with students, uh, with uh, senior congressional staffers, with high school students, uh, with policymakers, with uh, uh, you know community leaders, uh, we know that our approach shifts the needle. It makes an impact. Thank you so much, Avi. Um, I see you're sitting near a window. Is you're in Jerusalem, aren't you? No, I was um, I was born in Jerusalem. I raised. You were in born Jerusalem. in Jerusalem. Well, Okay. Born and grew up in Jerusalem. I'm, in, I'm an ancient Jerusalemite. Oh. Um, and you know, I have an interesting story to tell you about it, talking about narratives. It's interesting. I'm an ancient Jerusalemite. My ancestors, ancestors, uh, my grand grandfather was a chief rabbi of a Sephardic synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem in the 1800s. Um, so I, I have, as we say in Hebrew, a lot of yichus. I'm coming from a, a lot of yichus. And um, I, I, I was born in Jerusalem, my kids born in Jerusalem, I grew up in Jerusalem. And, um, and one of my most um, admired uh, poets is a Jerusalemite, he passed away, very well known poet, his name was uh, Yehuda Michai. Oh. Uh, he was a very well known poet around the world, he was, and he was writing a lot of songs about Jerusalem. A couple of months ago, when I was, as I'm doing every day, when I was screening huge amount of information in Arabic, because I'm fluent in Arabic and I'm talking to people in the Arab world and I'm reading articles and I'm listening to interviews and so I came across an inter, inter, interesting article written by an Iraqi Arab who, who wrote about something amazing. He told, he wrote about a Palestinian professor in Gaza Street who taught his students a song about Jerusalem. But he didn't tell him who write the, the song. He just told them the song in Arabic. And the students, the Gaza, the Palestinian students in Gaza were asked, who do you think wrote this song? And they were like, well, obviously a Palestinian wrote that song because it expresses a lot of emotion to Jerusalem. And, and when the professor told them that this song was written by an Israeli Jew poet, Jerusalemite, it was very difficult for them to accept that. Um, you know, that episode is going back in a way to the story of narratives. Exactly. Was, was that the name, the name of um, uh, Yuda Amichai's poem, Jerusalem? Was it called Jerusalem? Yuda Amichai uh, wrote many poems and he had uh, large sectors, many poems that he wrote specifically about Jerusalem. And it happens to be that the poem that the Palestinian professor in Gaza Street was teaching his students was one of my favorite poems. I could almost, uh, you know, quote it by heart. Uh, you remember the, the name of it? Um, I don't remember the name exactly, but it's it's interesting poem because it tells the story of like, um, uh, he said something like that. You know, Jerusalem was divided between 19 physically between 1948 and 1967, part of the city was controlled and ruled by Jordan and the other part was ruled by Israel. I was born in Jerusalem in 1960. So I was born into reality of a divided city. And in one of his poems, uh, Yudha Amichai wrote that, um, he wrote, from our side, meaning the Israeli Jewish part of the city, we could see the laundry drying up on the other side. I, I have city. that poem. I have that poem right here, Abby. Let me recite it. Do you yes, have? Yes, that would be there? that would that would be awesome. Yeah, on a roof in the old city, laundry hanging in the late afternoon sunlight. The white sheet of a woman who is my enemy. The towel of a man who is my enemy. To wipe off the sweat of his brow. In the sky of the old city, a kite. At the other end of the stream, a child. I can't see because of the wall. 
We have put up many flags. They have put up many flags to make us think that they're happy, to make them think that we're happy. Amazing poem, eh? It is. Amazing. I'm, I'm going to definitely look at uh, the other work that he's done. Uh, finding I'm, very, I'm very impressed that you find it because I think we have to make it clear to the audience and to the listeners that was not that was not a stage episode. I mean, it came out as part of our discussion and you, while we are talking, you were able to find it. Exactly, exactly. And what a coincidence, right? What a coincidence. Same page, same page. Yeah. Finding hope within conflict can be challenging, but it's important in bringing about long-term resolution. Avi's new book, Inside the Middle East, Entering a New Era, is now available to pre-purchase on Amazon. Please go get it. Education, education, education. Avi, thank you so much for your time and effort. Shalom, salam, thank you. Thank you so much, Oli. Shalom and salam.